Welcome to ISA Presents Scene Crafting with Max Tim and three of our top 25 screenwriters to watch. This is going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us. This is a brand new event for us, something that we've been talking about for a while. It's Max's um, idea. I, I, that, that's exactly what I was looking for. Brainchild. Thank you. Um, and so we're going to bring it to fruition today. We're going to have a lot of fun. Um, if there's a, a few hiccups, please forgive us. Um, it's the first time. So enjoy, sit back and relax and watch these brilliantly talented writers write. Thanks, Molly. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Max Tim. I'm the director of education with the ISA. I'm also a consultant. I've been working one-on-one -on -one with writers for almost, I think I'm in year 15 at this point. Um, and so the impetus for this event really came from how often I find myself um, giving, I don't mean this in a negative way, but the same note, um, because a lot of writers are working from a level of the page. Of course, that's the world we live in. We're in the page all the time. Um, and a lot of the questions that come up are, are kind of, and sometimes a subtle way, sometimes not such a subtle way, um, just asking for the exact right answer. How do I write this line of scene direction? How do I do a scene heading? Um, how do I approach formatting and just the words on the page? And it's difficult for me to give one right answer because it really is relative to so many things. Um, voice, genre, uh, your intention in terms of the feeling that you're trying to have the reader have. Um, and so there are a lot of things that come up that a lot of times if a writer asks me, you know, is it okay to write, write a scene direction line in this way? And I'm like, sure, <laughs> you know, most of the time it's fine, it, it, unless it, you know, it's obvious and rarely is there really an obvious nature to being incorrect on the page. Um, some examples can be really long block paragraphs or chunks pair of paragraphs of, of scene direction. Um, or you're just kind of getting a little over the top in terms of, you know, describing the dew on, you know, bl a blade of grass and, you know, I mean, some maybe that's important and that, you know, this is why it's sometimes a little relative, but we're not writing a novel. We're sticking to a visual representation of not only your story, but the words. And that's what's so difficult about what we do. The only paint and paintbrush we have are this really boring black and white stupid screenwriting software <laughs> and the words that we're needing to use in order to then deliver so many things you know from story to character to concept to tone and emotion and laughter or, or scare you know so i came up with the idea then to let's try to get three writers on who are comfortable typing in front of a live audience <laughs> which is you know it's sometimes a little nerve-wracking it's easy when you're just by yourself and you end up writing quickly but um but with the intent to show everyone in the audience that here is why this particular writer chose this particular word this line of scene direction how the scene the dialogue is working down the page when to cut in between a line of dialogue with the line of scene direction you know after a while it, it is something that um is difficult to explain because it really and i'm sure the three writers here can attest to this that it really just becomes a feeling after a while you just kind of feel it and you get into a rhythm and it's an energy and a momentum um so it's it it'll be interesting to see what kind of commentary we receive from the three writers as they're writing this um and it's totally okay if you just want to get into the zone and write it out for everybody to see but that's what we're going to be doing we're going to be sharing each individual scene i'm going to be commenting um asking questions maybe every now and then stopping them and just saying you know what what made you choose this or etc sometimes i'll let you just roll with it and have fun and let's just see the scene unfold um before i introduce the writers i do want to let everybody know that when we were preparing for the event and i sent out an email to the writers that agreed to do this thankfully um they all received the same parameters so i told them um in here i'll just read it out you can choose any location the genre can be anything from animated or live action um, it could be feature or tv it doesn't really matter since it's just one scene um, and the number of characters is three maximum and then the main character intention so one character will be trying to convince another character to say yes to something and then the secondary character or the opponent whichever you might have in the scene 
that character is not going to agree with the main character is attempting or intending and will in the end convince the main character of something entirely different. So that's the primary parameter. There are just a couple little rules. The characters cannot stay in the same location for the entire scene. And I think I'm, I'm going into a little bit of a lecture here, everybody. So I apologize to Chris, Yolanda and Meg for just sitting there smiling as, <laughs> as I'm talking, but it's important to note this because I get this brought up a lot. Um, just because you have a new scene heading does not necessarily mean it's an entirely new scene. And I know that to some people it may seem like, duh, of course, but you know, not to everybody. I get that a lot. When you're detailing an outline and you're going through your scene list, you know, you find out you have like 40 scenes in your first act or something. You don't technically. You might have 40 scene headings. So anyway, it's just a nice distinction to make. And then the second rule was that we don't want um, more than five pages. And it's funny how you all chose to do exactly five. <laughs> <laughs> you're taking as much time as you can with the with the scenes um but uh anyway th that's those are the parameters um and everybody got the same ones and it's, it's going to be interesting to see how different each of these scenes are because they really are um let's start with with meg this will be the order in which we we present the scenes but meg just give us a little bit of a background on who you are um and maybe just a, some tiny you know frame of reference for the scene itself yeah, um, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's cool to and terrifying somewhat to, to be here and we'll see how my typing skills are. Uh, yeah, I'm Meg Switlow. I predominantly write genre, uh, a lot of horror stuff and rom-coms, my rom-com writing partner's on. Um, and I won the ISA um, Shoot Your Sizzle uh, in 2020, right before you know, the world exploded and then, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we, haven't, we didn't get to film that, but, and then I also was a fast track uh, genre winner last round. Um, but today I'm not, no one's getting beheaded in this scene. And it's just, it's kind of a fun, more slice of life scene. Cause I wanted, that's kind of the idea that I came up with. And um, I tried to make it horror, but um, you know, this is what I came up with and I just had fun with it. It's interesting though. So you wrote this scene just for this event, right? There's, is it a part of a larger story? You know, I just kind of, I thought it might be a good short. And so I just, I, I got that and I was like, what can I do? Should I use something, uh, should I make something new or utilize something I already have? And I just kind of wanted to challenge myself. So I, I wrote this Sunday, Monday. That's um, great. You know, do it. It's great. All right. Well, we'll go to Chris. And it's interesting, Chris, this is the opening scene for a new project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I too, uh, I was, I had just finished a thing around the time that I got the email from you guys when you invited me to do this. So I was like, yes, I want to do it. I have no freaking idea what to give you. Um, <laughs> but I had this sort of off genre idea that I've been kicking around for a long time. And it, it was sort of a fun excuse to, um, to kickstart it. I thought I was going to give you the third scene. I, I sort of, I have a clear idea of the first handful of scenes in this feature. And um, I thought I was going to give you the third scene, but it, it turned out it was just going to be too confusing to, um, to set it up. And I was like, well, why don't I just do the, I'll write the first scene because that's the one where I want to peel off the layers and reveal what kind of world we're in. And that's a sort of fun, I belabor the first scene like always too much. So I thought um, I would share that belaboring with you. So just give a little bit of a background, how you were a fast track fellow with us and you know, where have you been going since then? Yeah, so uh, I, uh, I started as a, as a fiction writer and a playwright. And then when I started working in Hollywood, um, that, that sort of put me in some like grounded sci-fi terrain. So mostly dramas, mostly television and um, met the ISA through the Fast Track Fellowship where we, we toured around Hollywood um, with a project that is still kicking, believe it or not. Great. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and since then I've been working mainly on developing TV shows that you have never heard of because I'm developing them and still <laughs> developing them and still developing them. Yolanda, let's just move to you and you can give a little background and talk about the scene. Okay, hello, good morning, everyone. Um, so I am Yolanda. Uh, Meg, I love your hair, by the way. Uh, but like Meg, you know, and, and Christopher, um, um, I, I am an actress also. 
uh, a writer and producer. I've been out here in LA for the last uh, 10 plus years. And uh, how I came to uh, the ISA uh, development slate was through a pitch contest last year. Uh, I had pitched a uh, television pilot that I'd started writing. And uh, um, once I had finished that pilot, I had the whole concept and the idea. But long story short, I went through the, the pitch contest that you all had and was selected as one of the, the finalists for the pitch contest. And that's when you guys let me know that I was selected to be a part of that amazing development slate. And uh, ever since then, you know, things have just been constantly taking off. I was recently selected uh, by Coverfly for their pitch week and was able to pitch that same project to a and &E networks and right. you know landed a second meeting with them and you know just still you know working on that and finally got an executive producer attached to both that project and my feature film project amazing so, you know right now what i'm doing is continuing to develop so that i can have stuff in my arsenal because you know as with all of you guys you know that once you you know people get engaged with your projects they also want to know what other projects you have totally um, and so for for me i just want to make sure that i'm continuing to keep those type of projects that i'm willing to stay with until they actually get done um yeah. but i'm still working on uh, that we are here through that circuit and you know still dealing with a and e on whether or not they're gonna you know decide to pick that project up you know they they they're going through you know that whole machine um, but I'm just excited. And, and what I decided to uh, write today is a pilot that's based off of my life. Uh, I wanted to be an opera singer, but I also feel like there is a, um, a, a, a missing area in the market for people who uh, come from underprivileged backgrounds who have these dreams and goals and just trying to get to the other side to be seen, to be heard. And, you know, this particular project takes you through that journey of my life and my So family. this is new? It's new. It's okay. definitely new. Yeah. And I crafted that scene because I had started writing the pilot in 2019 and then I stopped because I went to focus in all on We Are Here, you know, and finishing Her Favorite Color, which was a feature film that I've been working on as well. Cause I work in both, you know, people say, are you film or TV? I'm both, you know, sure. uh, but I'm finding more excitement in developing TV projects nowadays um, than just necessarily sticking in the film lane. Cause it seems like the industry is constantly moving towards, you know, television, you know? So that's kind of like where I am. Yeah. Cool. Well, I love it. And I, what's interesting is just how different the three of you are. It's going to be fun for the audience to experience this. I wrote out just some thoughts here um, about scene writing and the importance of the difference between, you know, it's not just a scene heading, you know, the, it, the, there's a there's a new scene heading or a location, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a new scene, like I was saying before. So for instance, you know, if we are looking at the process of a story in general, the concept of just the concept of story in a, the most basic sense, you have a beginning, middle and end. Mm -hmm. You have a setup, you have a character experiencing conflict and drama and obstacles, et cetera. They're pursuing something. And then there's some, some form of a resolution, positive and negative, et cetera. A scene exists pretty much in the same exact way. There may not be as much of a resolution, but there is some level of a climactic feeling to the end of a series of moments. And that's, I think, important to note that a scene is a series of moments or just one moment. You know, this is why it's all relative. And that's why I, I told the three writers that you don't have to fill up all five pages, but I, I love that they did. <laughs> um, so when thinking about scene writing, you, you know, you have to come from a place of presented conflict, conflict confrontation, and then some kind of resolution, you know, so it helps not only in brainstorming new scenes, but also in detailing the current scenes you already have, let's say you already have an outline, um, or the finished script, you throw that into just like a, a beat sheet, if you will, or a, a scene list. But then to detail each an in individual scene, you have to check to see how am I setting up the scene? How am I getting through it? Is there a winner or a loser to the scene? And that's why the parameters I gave included this idea of one character attempting to do something and it changes by the end. Someone else convinces that character to go a different route in some way. 
And I did it on purpose, but just about every scene has something like that. There's a redirect. It's kind of like a joke, right? You've got set up a redirect punchline. A scene works pretty much in the same way. And we all need to be thinking about that. You know, it, and I think an important emphasis also needs to be made on the word conflict and drama. In a much larger conceptual sense, those two words don't necessarily need to be negative. And you'll see in Meg's uh, project, there is, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see in this, uh, how Meg um, responds to some of my questions, but um, that scene could have very easily gone off the rails into epic fight. <laughs> you know, and so it, the, the word choice is important, momentum, momentum is important, but understanding the central conflict in the scene, the scene then revolves around that you can then go any way you want. It could be any location. The dialogue might be able to be the same, but then they're doing something different. And so anyway, there are a lot of choices that come into play and I'm making this a lot easier said than done. But it's important to remember, you know, a situation can be fun. It can be enlightening. It can be heartwarming, but there's still some form of an obstacle to get through it. And too often we, we see scenes either flow a little too long and it's like, why I'm forgetting the point of the scene or we wait too long to get to the point. And so it'll be, it'll be fun for everyone, I hope anyway, to watch us all you know, right through these scenes. All right, so Meg, you use Final Draft 12, correct? Yes, I got it last week because it came out last week. So I'm not like, I'm not an expert at it, but I've used it a couple of okay. times, so. Have you used other screenwriting programs? Yeah, um, the rom-com, I got hired to write a rom-com and my, writing partner is in Indiana right now. And so we've been writing on writer duet because we didn't yeah. have 12 yet. So I don't right. love writer duet, but it's, and it can be a little confusing to go back and forth between the two. Yeah. But, so yeah. but I like final draft and I've also used Celtics, but I feel like that was okay. when I was new. Yeah. Celtics is one of those things where the formatting doesn't always fit as, as well as it should. And it's kind of noticeable. So everybody watching, I yeah. get it. I get it. The final draft can be expensive, but it's worth it. It's the it's industry. Worth it. It's worth it. I think people know. And I think it's like worth that, whatever the amount right. is. It's yeah. Worth it. Yeah. Um, All right. I'll let you get into the, the beginning of the scene here. So this is kind of based off of my own life. Um, so we went with, I went with Brian for a character name because my husband's name is Brad. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, he's a chipper calming force. Um, I'm setting it in a car. Yeah, we're interior car. Yeah. You can figure out why I named this character Maggie. Do people call you Maggie? My mom does. Does my she really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, that's cute. Come on. Um, my husband says I'm single-minded. <laughs> <laughs> At least it's energetic and it's not a boring single-minded. No. Yeah, I mean... You much to his dismay um, is, uh, I mean, in a good way. Um, so I just wanted to give some information. I was also, so before I started writing uh, screenwriting, I was a breaking news writer um, and you have to write real fast when celebrities die. Oh. Um, so hopefully, I used to not know how to type, but um, uh but let's, I, let's pause one sec, Mike, just because we have some comments. You know, some people, their screens might be small. So are you able to just make, blow it up a little bit and zoom in? Oh, how, um, maybe. down in the bottom right, you can see the, okay. yeah. See if we can make that a little bit bigger. Is that, does that work? Let everybody, let us know everyone in the comments. Yeah, please let hopefully, me know. Hopefully I'm not looking at the comments. Yeah. My ADHD can't handle all of that. No, that's fine. Um, thank you, though, for the comment, Vaughn, um, because we want to make sure. So Noreen's saying, great. This should work if you need to, you know, spread out the, the margins or something, Meg, it's fine. But Does that um, work? Okay. Yeah, I think we're looking good. Um, and I just adding this, um, you know, hot dog, hot dog buns. So you kind of uh, understand, you know, maybe they're going to a barbecue or something. Okay. Um, all right. And... Oh, looks like they're um, I didn't do that M dash correctly, but okay. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, we're going to ignore any kind of typos or, or little goops here, everybody. This is just to get a sense of the scene in the writing. Yeah. And for me, I like to throw in, I, 
I have a lot of personality, so I like to really use my voice in, in the action lines. And it's what people have commented on, on a lot of my writing is that I have a strong voice in the writing and, um, and the action lines. It's so, so important. And you know what, I'll let you keep writing while I kind of talk about voice a little bit. Um, and you know, everybody, hopefully if you don't want to listen to me. It's totally fine. <laughs> keep reading. Um, but voice is essential, right? I mean, what voice does is not only instill a sense of tone and feeling, in terms of the overall script and by tone and feeling i mean you as the writer are in a way controlling the reader to make sure they feel something the best way to do that is to connect yourself with the material and on a not only a personal level but on a commentary kind of level right like if you're writing a horror movie but you want it to be kind of campy or a little goofy then it's word choice that you have to be choosing correctly within the scene direction to then be able to give us that that feeling um if it's just going to be downright horrific um craig zoller is a, a pro longtime pro uh, rewrite artist in town and he wrote he wrote this script called bone uh, tomahawk it's just epically horrific and incredibly suspenseful and his voice then was infusing this level of just suspense and and um emotional difficulty and and uh how uh, i i keep using the word suspenseful um but you really have to be making the right decisions from a voice level and meg i think does such a great job here in terms of you know just commentary um and you know the playful couple looks like they're dressed to go to a barbecue because they are just a fun little comment like that helps instill you know a feeling i try to from the very top i try to like give that a little bit of my voice at the top so that we know this is fun. This is my voice. I'm cheeky. I'm irreverent. Um, totally. You know, and that's easy for the reader, I think, to, to get from there. And I also wanted people to know that they're playful. Like if you can read this and it can seem like a, a big fight, but it's, it's really, it's not. And I don't want it to seem that way. So, right. um, you know, so, and I wanted to establish a conflict from the top, which is they, they're they they're talking about having a baby or he wants to talk about that. Yeah, so great. That. Um, I see Chris is making comments in the comment. Keep going, Meg. But okay. uh, Chris, you want to select panelists and attendees when you're in the little two section right above where you're typing. Otherwise, you're, you're only sending your comments to, to me <laughs> and Meg and, and, uh, and Yolanda. Um, but anyway, yeah, let's keep going. Okay um says nothing brian turns off the ac i'm cold i'm hot um maggie turns on the ac so they're already having you know that these little these fights about you know something small yeah when it's really and they're hot. driving like they're they're moving yeah 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 yes they are moving they're not just sitting in a car that's why i wrote in the first sentence it drives um, <laughs> thank you okay <laughs> uh tongue out of him this is you know another thing that we know that this is not you know mean-spirited right 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 but it also shows something about the relationship yeah you know one of them isn't going to be overly sensitive um okay. yeah so this is one thing so yeah, as you said, like there is not necessarily one way to do something. There's certainly ways to do something wrong, but like yeah. I Googled this, like I don't know the answer for everything. And so I Googled this um, as the pronounced banal. Um, uh, or banal. <laughs> well, that's the big, that's the big debate. That's yeah. the big debate. Um, and Yeah, and there are ways to look at the parentheticals differently. You know, he's he. You're telling the reader he's saying it in that way. Yeah. Um, as opposed to a whole separate line of a parenthetical, to you know, like you would select it in Final Draft and make it, the formatting would bounce it down below the line. You're just making a note for the reader there so that we can understand how he said it. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to like 
stop stop the flow of the read. Right, right. Yeah, so Maggie's catching on in terms of how he pronounced this as banal. Banal. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I explained how she pronounces it, which is yeah. correctly, um, which is banal. And I Googled all these things. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm seeing, keep going, Meg. Um, but I'm seeing in the comments people in talking about um, putting character description within parentheses. Um, and this is another example of sure, go ahead. Um, I've seen both sides, just like Chris is, is saying in the comments. Um, you can put it in parentheses or not. Usually, if you're putting it in parentheses, it's going to be very short, distinct. It's 33, comma, you know, cold faced, um, you know, like whatever Meg has up there. It's just word, 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 as opposed to a description. That really ultimately is the difference between choosing should I put my description in parentheses or not. If you don't, then you have a little bit of leeway to kind of get into, um, like I read once in a, in a um, script describing a character not in parentheses, and it said, you know, this character as even keeled as a right angle. And I'm like, all right. And then with the additional description of, you know, how he's dressed kind of like a geek. And so I got a sense of who that character was. And so you can get maybe a little more literary in terms of that description. Um, like I said, if you're using the parentheses to describe it, it's going to be very basic. 33, this, this, this. And it, it's just to, in a way to speed up the read. Yeah. And like Elliot is saying in the comments, just be consistent. If you do it once, then you're going to be describing characters that way all the time. Yes, I did. I was like, was that consistent? I was, but yeah. I, I sometimes do one or the other um, on it, you know, depending on what script uh, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, and so this is them, you know, this, this um, with the prompt is, you know, she's trying to convince him that he is wrong. Right. So. Rhymes with anal. Now anal here's, rhymes with anal. Here's part of the twist of the scene, though. So what what Meg is doing, and you'll see, is that she. It's not just an, a scene of them constantly bickering about whether or not you pronounce it banal or banal. It, it she, you know, Brian comes in with this little remark of reminds rhymes with anal, and what I think is so fun about this moment um, is that not only does he flick the AC off, it's a he's kind of like throwing down, you know the the gauntlet in a way and he smiles at her and now he's going to be waiting for her response and that response i think is interesting of course i have a dog barking in the background maggie saying i told you it's never happening <laughs> so he was once in in a fun way we're coming in late to this moment like they've already had a conversation about this and as opposed to the first time they've ever had it. And I think that's an important little note to make that, you know, we as writers, we want to assume that these characters exist. They just exist in the world. They have their own lives. Um, they've had experiences that we haven't necessarily experienced alongside of them. So we're coming in late. You know, it's that idea of get into a, a scene late, get out early. Uh, this is also taken from this idea of get in late to the overall situation who these characters are. We don't necessarily need a full rundown of you know, here's the introduction to everything about them. We're just getting a glimpse into who they are by way of this conversation. So my background is all improv comedy and stand up. Um, and there's just a lot of rules from improv that I have, as you said, like, you know, uh, assume, make a lot of assumptions about the, um, about the relationship. Um, yeah. Totally. And Alicia is catching on. She says, I love this. The repetition is so natural for couples off on off on. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's just literally, I mean, and this is like my brother honestly keeps getting puppies. It's like <laughs> weird. <laughs> and it's, it's fun that, you know, Maggie just says immediately, my body isn't built for that. Can you just admit you're wrong? And he doesn't, you know, he just kind of sits there and Maggie then kind of changes the subject. Um, my brother got another puppy and he just goes you know, along with that portion of the conversation. He's not trying to get back to a convincing of doing something that she doesn't want to do. Um, 
And so they can just kind of comment on this puppy situation for a second. I mean, I wanted it to, you know, go back and forth and back and forth because that's how people speak. Right. I mean, yeah. that's how that's how this ADD person. Um, only he doesn't wear them. <laughs> uh, yeah, only he doesn't. Only he, oh, only he. I probably should have gone with what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. You know, yeah. I, I am not someone who is, uh, I know nobody is, I don't think, like, you know, keeps doing it perfectly. No. Not from, the, from, the, from the jump. Totally. Yeah. I mean, this was, how many times did you write this scene? Um, a few, and I got, like, notes. Oh, you um, did get notes on it. Okay, great. I did. You know, I, I go to other people, people who know my writing. I have a writing group and, you know, we took a few minutes on it. Um, um, and I make my husband read everything. <laughs> Obviously. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. And Mateo was making an interesting comment. He's saying anyone else, anyone else scrolling up to reread things only to realize it's not my screen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Response. We'll we'll do that once once Meg is done once we, all the writers are done just so we can do a flow through the scene again because obviously we're going through this a lot slower than you would be reading it um, but again it's the it's the purpose with the purpose of of watching her write this out um, you know and this is obviously they're talking about puppies but they're not talking about puppies yeah meanwhile I have puppies on the outside I of know my, I mean like I literally. <laughs> You know, and that's that's like you know, you write something, but you're really talking about something else. Like what's yeah, that is so important to note that dialogue is a very tricky to th thing to get a hang of um, because it's really easy to speak exactly to what the the character is wanting or thinking, et cetera, et cetera. And in real life, we don't really talk that way. We don't necessarily just come right out and say exactly what's on our mind. We kind of talk around it based on the situation we're in, right? And we're either trying to get something or we're apologizing for something or we're hoping for something. It's all about the emotion and then the subtlety of the line to hopefully get across that level of emotion. Um, so now we're getting back into, you know- Now we're going back to yeah. how Maggie's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you'll notice how clean the page is too. You know, she, Meg isn't, trying to break up every line of dialogue to make sure that the audience understands exactly every movement of the character. We don't need to do that all the time. Every now and then, and you'll see, you know, how different the coming pages or scenes are, but with Chris and Yolanda, every now and then it is important because an essential element to the page is remembering that movement or blocking says, can say just as much as a line of dialogue. In this particular scene, it's all about the back and forth it's all about beliefs and and intent in terms of you know their the dialogue itself so there isn't a lot of, of movement in terms of the need to you know express that movement yeah and when i write uh horror i i have more scene direction because it really it's so much about those misdirects this person's looking there and then like something behind that behind them and i don't need to do that this is about that quick clip um yeah you know, I'm also here trying to just show that, like, just their relationship of, you know, laughing at themselves, laughing at each other. You know, and the impasse seems to be about the. You know, you know what's interesting about that line, and I'm probably going much deeper than you were necessarily thinking here, Meg. Maybe no, I'm maybe. very deep, so it's probably <laughs> yeah. that's what I was doing. But it's interesting because, you know, he chuckles at himself. She's not pleased. And, and what Brian's talking about is, you know, I think the whole world knows that she talks a lot. That's what he's saying. You talk too much. Mm -hmm. And had, she, had Maggie just kind of crossed her arms and not said anything, it, he, he'd be right. <laughs> or he you know he would be wrong but she just continues going with her character she continues to talk i guess we're at an impasse like she tries to get the the, the herself out through dialogue and so i don't know i think it's an interesting little back and forth there she could have just not said, not said anything and it would have had a different feeling mm -hmm. brian where where am i where am i i guess we're at an impasse okay 
<laughs> and then he wants to go back to the bigger conversation. And she is an interrupter. <laughs> mm. You know, and these are these things of like single minded. Right. Yeah. That's a good point, too. If you set up a character to be a particular way up front, then they have to be that way. Like, otherwise, it's not going to necessarily jive with with how the reader is, is expecting. What is the level of expectation? So yeah. Still... I mean, if, if you have like a three word intro, like use it. Yeah, right. And then you notice everyone you know, watching, you know, she uses the hyphens in Brian's dialogue. Can we please get back to what? And then can you please just admit you're wrong? I do that a lot too. I actually love doing that because it just, it speeds up the read. What those hyphens do is it forces the eye of the reader to immediately go down to the next line of dialogue. If you put um, ellipses, three dots, it's a much slower entry into the next line. It's a tiny, tiny thing but it, it makes a difference in the mind of the reader. Like if I see, can we please go back to what dot, 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 it means he's paused and kind of thought about something. And then Maggie was waiting to continue, but the hyphen cuts it off. Yeah, and like in a lot of horror stuff too, it's like people are screaming. So it's like, it's a lot of cut off. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, and I'm a, Meg is a cutter offer, so. <laughs> cutter offer. <laughs> Mm. and you know these are things for me some of the words are what my husband mispronounces but um uh because it is not the danube boys and girls. <laughs> danube <laughs> you know and and these are just things that like you know i have a producer and i i and just went out with a something called witch please and she kept calling it a coven and i'm like it's not like do I really I'm like it is not pronounced oh, COVID. It's pronounced yeah COVID. <laughs> no that one I can kind of understand banal bano um maybe Danube you know but come on it's coven this is it's coven guys yeah it's coven um And honestly, nobody thought this, but um, symphony, but you know, <laughs> I, I it was a makeup. Yeah. Uh, there you go. I'm glad to see Rachel. It's, uh, there's at least one thing that everyone is learning. <laughs> Rachel's understanding the diff difference between a hyphen and the ellipses. Um, that's good. Mm -hmm. Mr. Wizard, it's funny. I. I I like saying that sometimes, and most people of uh, no idea what that is. They don't Whatever. Know what Mr. Is. <laughs> That's fine. Um, and now I have not figured out. I forgot how to figure out parenthetical and the new there way we to go. do this. There we go. There we go. Um, Everybody saw that. I hope you know. You actually select the yeah. formatting of parenthetical as opposed to hitting enter and then tabbing over, you can tell in the formatting difference. And what beat is, most of you probably know, it's just a pause. There's no sound, there's no discussion, there's no you know visual representation. She just, it, there's like a, he, Brian doesn't react. So you can use beat as a little bit of a cheat instead of going in, you know, down to a line of scene direction and saying, Brian doesn't say anything. She just throws in a parenthetical of beat. And then she goes into, basically a different subject <laughs> yep um yeah Asking about diet coke brian slows and he thinks they should stop yeah or yeah. doesn't want to stop he doesn't want to stop but then you like he stops because there's a red light right 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 <laughs> yeah which, and that's the comedy that's the comedy of it all. <laughs> but i do use a lot of beat like beats when with comedy stuff just to like let that land yeah so Helen, it's it's a good question. Uh, generally, I've read beat is frowned on by readers. Uh, in a general sense, no. If you use it like crazy and it's overused, or if, if you're using it at a spot which may not necessarily need the beat, um, 
then sure, it, it, it'll be frowned on. Again, it's like, I can't remember the person who commented before, as long as you're consistent, you're not overusing things like parentheticals in general, much less beat. Um, it's fine. It, it, honestly, most readers are not going to bat an eye. If they do, they're trying too hard. Honestly, they're trying to find something that's wrong. You know, I have a producer who reads everything, everything. I'm doing two projects with her and she reads everything with a fine tooth comb and, um, which is why I know my M dashes are done incorrectly. Um, you know, and those, that's not something anyone's ever. Yeah. And Helen, it's again, a good question. Isn't it better to use something more imaginative and yes and no, you know, it's completely relative to the moment, like that moment with Brian, it's a tiny little beat. You know, we don't necessarily need the, the emphasis of a visual. We don't need the emphasis of the movement of an arm. This is a quick, read right I mean this is bam 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 it's dialogue 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 the, the banter is quick uh, the beat actually allows for the read to continue down the page much faster if you break it up and you use a scene direction to to use just a more imaginative way of expressing a, a moment of silence it actually slows the read down and, and really the whole um, how ironic that pronunciation is under oh you did spend as well okay <laughs> i read it incorrectly um but the whole point for this particular type of script a romantic comedy especially is for it to be fast to be a quick read um a lot of a, a, a romantic comedy is reliant upon the dialogue right i mean that it's yeah. information is coming out through dialogue the jokes are coming out through dialogue if you read when harry met sally you know it's it's all about the back and forth between harry and sally because that's the relationships we're not relying on these really moving you know uh, visualizations of something you know it's it's much different and you'll see though when we jump into chris and yolanda's that it is different yeah and um i had my writers group read this and i could just see when these lines when i had the lines of what I, it just slowed everything down. It's just not as fun. Right. Um, so, uh, and this is the part where basically they find out who's right, um, which is her. And then there's the second pronunciation. Yeah, which is kind of ridiculous. I've never actually heard it pronounced banal, but. It's not, it's, and the, I'm sorry, but like fuck the second pronunciation, <laughs> <laughs> not real. Um, <laughs> which is what Maggie says. <laughs> yeah, Grace, the moonlighting, there's a ton of banter. And really what you'll notice in terms of, um, and you're writing with this with the intention for it to be a feature, Mag, right? I'm really writing this. So I've been, I've directed a bunch of short films recently so that I can direct a feature so I can get experience. And that's kind of actually, I mean, it would actually be more of a pilot, um, but really it's just something like I wanted to shoot something that uh, I wanted to write something that I could chew. Great, yeah. Um, what you'll notice with sitcoms, especially traditional network sitcoms, the scene writing or scene direction is very sparse. They very are, sparse. they sometimes don't even add anything. It's just bam, 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 bam line after line after line. Um, if you go and do a half hour comedy that isn't on a network, they're gonna use a little bit more in terms of the scene direction. The page count can be longer um, on a non-network half hour. Um, so then they're not too much worried about the actual page count. With on network half hour comedies, I mean, it's, it's a specific amount of pages. It's in 24 to 27 maybe 28. It's very rare that I see it go over 30 pages for a Big Bang Theory type of sitcom. Um, a lot of half hour comedies now, of course, are going to the streamers and so they can get away with, with a longer page count. That then you know, relates to how many lines of scene direction can we use? Um, so the point being, you know, Moonlighting was a very traditional, I shouldn't say traditional or very, but it's a you know half hour comedy on an, a network. It's a much older show, so there's much more of an emphasis on on dialogue, which every sitcom is. You know, every every time you watch Friends, how often are we really referencing what they're doing? If they are physically doing something, it's part of the joke. You know, you also don't need to if you know if you already know your cast. It's been going on for a while. You don't need to be as direction heavy because you know what they're going to do and they know their characters. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Know. So. But if you're doing this in front of an 
studio audience of ISA members. Um, <laughs> yeah. Brian does a little car dance. And so this is kind of like, um, you know, the thing she was trying to convince him of, she, she didn't. Right, correct. However, there's a more important thing of convincing going on, which I think is why, why I just love how the scene ends. And so we're just we're just getting there here. Yeah. And then and then this is the other thing of their fighting over the AC. And then so she, then she turns off the AC, which is what he wanted. Um, uh, um, let me know you off the AC. And then and he rolls down the window, which was not an option before. Mm -hmm. And she rolls down the compromise, marriage. <laughs> And it's interesting, you know, kind of going along the lines of what, um, oh, I'm forgetting the commenter's name here. I think it was uh, Helen. Yeah, Helen Rose um, about the difference between beat and, you know, mentioning a long pause. What, what, why, I'll just ask this right out to you, Meg. Why write there's a long pause there instead of beat? Because I think it's something that like, uh, a beat to me is like a breath. This isn't a breath. There's like, that's like, I'm, a moment of like contemplation is what Great. I think. Beautiful. Um, I believe that it needs its own separate line. Yeah. So, and now they're back to that, the thing we discussed at the top of the scene. Yeah. Uh, time, no anal, love an anal joke, I guess, in this <laughs> Um And then. No, she still doesn't want to take it seriously. Um, Can't really blame her. Yeah, I mean that. I did, yeah, that's not what I meant. Uh, she doesn't <laughs> want to take baby conversation seriously. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we had them setting out toward a destination. So part of um, the process of the scene is, you know, there is. A destination. There's a pursuit to get somewhere, but there's also an emotional pursuit. So there's a, it's a fun little way of look at looking at the difference between plot and character within a scene, right? You've got the basic plot. The situation is they're going to a barbecue, right? And that barbecue has certain people there, um, and there's going to be a topic of conversation that may be a little uncomfortable. But then, meanwhile, we're showing the emotional context of the pursuit here. One's trying to top the other. We eventually come to a level of compromise because there isn't going to be, you know, one convincing of the other. Um, so, you know, Mag's the other thing. Brian is wanting to talk about this. Um, she, we see un, unsure of what to say, and it, it's important, I think, for Meg to say for the first time, right? Yeah. And it's interesting that you're using a backslash in the scene heading, Meg. It says exterior street Ned's house, as opposed to a hyphen. Yeah, I mean, that's just how I've been. Um, as I said, I like have a producer who like vetted everything before I've taken it out to financiers and stuff like that. And that's how she prefers it. So interesting. Okay. And this is what I mean. Everything's different. As long as just keep it consistent. It's, yeah, as long as it's consistent. As you keep typing here, I'm going to explain what continuous is for everybody because this is something I see um, used incorrectly a lot. And what a true continuous is, it's really a very literal reference to production, you know, the camera. It's not necessarily telling the reader this is a continuation of the scene, because it's all one scene. But what continuous is telling us is that we're following the character from one room into another, from one location into another. So we're following them without a cut in the camera mm -hmm. to go from inside the car to the outside. So we're just having that camera go out, right out with them. We don't necessarily, as writers, need to reference that much in terms of production-related camera angles. We really kind of want to stay away from angle on this, or we, you know, we see that. Just get to the visual. A continuous is a way to play with that visual a little bit from a production standpoint. Because she, Maggie, leans back on the car and contemplates. So it's a continuation of the moment, yes, but it's also a continuation of the shot. Now Maggie's considering the idea of pregnancy which I love the use of the word in there, 
Brian says, really? There's a long pregnant pause. I mean, come on. I'm assuming you purposely used that word. I did. I thought that was cute. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and honestly, this is based on a, there's multiple conversations, but it's kind of like based on a conversation my husband and I have been talking about and these banal things, um, you know, leading to this kind of bigger conversation of like, okay. Yeah, great. I'm looking at the comments. Uh, Lewis is asking, instead of continuous, how about an inline cut to, you know, um, a cut to is usually along the lines of the family guy effect, where they're talking, the characters are talking about a particular subject, and then we cut to something that is in reference to the subject of the previous moment that we were experiencing you know family guy effect is like peter saying something like remember that time we did this and it was kind of weird and then bam we cut to seeing it and it's ridiculous and over the top and then we cut back to um in that moment it's it's quite uh, quite literally a continuation of the previous moments there wouldn't be a need for a cut for a cut to there um but of course cut twos can walk, uh, work sometimes yeah and i would have um, done with the, the diet coke thing if it was like a little bit different the the way things were set up being like i'm not i don't want to stop for diet coke and then it was cut to her like sipping on a diet coke in the car that okay. would have been a, that would have been the only time i would have done a cut to because it's like the joke or great oh, let's go woo like someone on a car trip and like and everyone's having fun and then cut to everyone's stuck in traffic like as right. a comedic device yes there's there's a, a, a um an emotional reason for the cut yeah. to but I see a lot of people just putting cut to because they don't understand that like it's actually not necessary. And yeah. you know, I just Google things if I don't know, which right. like, yeah. I don't know. I like John August's but take on things. I tend to. So the house door swings open. We're almost done with the scene. And it's funny because Brian says, because you know, I was kind of made to be a dad, and I think you'd be a really great. And then Meg says, Mom. And so it's a nice little end beat to this moment. I think mm -hmm. it's really cute. And then in the background. If you remember there's a lot about do the dogs and the puppies and uh, the brother having too many dogs and how it's responsibility <laughs> right right it's a call then, back to a previous joke yes and then insert title card you might want to just do title card i like insert title card and then the title which would be parents <laughs> I think this is so funny with a question mark. That would be the title of the. <laughs> this would be the title, parents. <laughs> oh God! Well, thank you, Meg. That's really fun. This is the end of this, <laughs> which we don't need to necessarily. I put. would not put that. No. Don't no. do that. Although yeah. we have uh, in something put, this is the end. You can cry now, but. Uh, my rom-com writing partner but that got crossed out by our producer. Uh, I like little things like that that's funny me too just put some flair in there anyway that's my short and my well bite. done everybody's saying great job really helpful so that's great we've got two more scenes so we're going to be learning new stuff uh, um, from from Chris and Yolanda too but thank you Meg that was fun so what I have is a Scribner document you um I use Final Draft, but I don't use Final Draft much if I can avoid it. Um, the ones I tend to use when I'm starting something off are this program, um, Highland, which lets me just write really simply. Interesting. Uh, and this other program, Scribner, which I like for reasons that I can't quite show you without giving away my whole method to what I'm doing right now. So, <laughs> okay. This is the first scene of a feature, correct? It is, yeah. So um, this is something I haven't quite written yet. So I have this idea in my head of what I think I want it to be. And um, particularly, I have the first couple scenes and the world of the thing and the tone of the thing and uh, a little bit about the characters. But I don't, I don't really know yet um, beyond that. So a little bit of this is just fishing around and trying to feel my way through it. For the first scene in particular, I had a really clear picture of what I wanted people to see. Um, and then I immediately, of course, got stymied on how to convey that to people. Um, so the first thing I did here, exterior street day, simple enough. Uh, I already got stuck on that. 
<laughs> because I was like, well, street doesn't really tell me very much. So do I want to be more specific about, um, you know, is it uh, a Los Angeles street, which it is, it's a city in, La it's a street in Los Angeles. But then I was like, well, there's a, actually a street in Los Angeles called Los Angeles street. So <laughs> I don't want that. Uh, and then part of what happens here is it's a really steep street. So I was like, steep street. Well, that, again, that sounds confusing. So eventually I just sort of retrenched and I was like, okay, just street sure. uh, day. And then um, as part of this mental image I have of what I want people to experience, uh, it's the idea that like, there's the first thing you see other than this still street is um, not something you see at all. It's this music playing that's getting closer. Yeah. Um, so I was like, okay, 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 that's great, that's great. Um, then I was, then I realized that didn't give anything to picture. So, um, so I spend a fair amount of effort, as you are already seeing, uh, trying to figure out what impression this is going to convey yeah. to a reader. And um, I don't belabor it this much once I'm on like page five or six or seven. But in terms of really setting up that first scene, um, I. I, I I cross out so many things and go back and, and change it and try it out this way and try it out that way and try it out that way. This so, is the torture of the writer, you know? So um, I cut that immediately after writing it. <laughs> That's how far I got. I, I worked, back, I got back negative word count uh, and replaced it. I wanted you to be able to see something first rather than hear okay. something first. So yeah, early morning on a quiet Los Angeles street. Okay, that's a little better. Um, now I need you to know, it's not just any street. It's one of those Los Angeles streets that goes straight up the side of a hill and then plunges straight down the other side. One of those sweaty palm roller coaster death trap streets. <laughs> and then, Which I think is important because not everybody lives in Los Angeles. They may not necessarily know that there are those types of streets here. Right, and uh, there was another version of this where it, the, the description said, not a boulevard, not a freeway, not a coastal drive. Uh, and then I wound up deleting that because I was like, well, I don't want to invoke in this second paragraph. I don't want people to start imagining the things that I don't want them to see. Right. So, yes. um, so I took that all out and I was like, what do I want them to see? I want them to see this really, really steep hill. Then I threw this in. I'm looking at you, Baxter Street. Yeah. Uh, and that's just a little sort of inside joke for the people who do live in LA who, who may have driven through Silver Lake to their near death. <laughs> on one of those streets that goes uh straight up to heaven and then straight down to hell yeah it is wild it's been it's kind of scary coming up because you're you can't see over the edge of the hill you're like i hope nobody's on the other side of this it's terrifying so yeah, yeah this uh this whole scene is a bit of an homage to baxter street okay and um there's a good chance i'll wind up cutting that line at right some point because it's process. just commentary it's there for me yeah yeah but right now it amuses me so i keep it <laughs> then the next thing I want you to see is that struggling to get up this street is a grocery store scooter. And this is the first thing that I really needed people to pay attention to. So I also belabored whether or not to go <laughs> all caps right, or uh, all caps on grocery store scooter or battery operated grocery store scooter. And eventually we just sort of settled back. Well, the irony is a scooter thing. could be a name. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I had this sort of like Buster Keatony, Charlie Chaplin image of this battery operated scooter trying to make its way up this 33 degree grade <laughs> okay. and just dying on the hill. Um, and then sitting on the scooter is Jonas, 20s, a happy-go-lucky guy in surf shorts, a Hawaiian shirt, and cheap flip-flops. Right. Um, and Got I could it. talk about how I belabored all that, but I'll try to keep it moving forward instead. Yeah, totally fine. Um, and then finally, I wanted to get back to the rock music that I invoked originally. Yeah. Like rocking out to a tinny Bluetooth speaker, maybe Crazy Train. And again, this was partly for me as I'm trying to imagine this world uh, and set up what I hope is this fun, goofy scene of this, of this goofy guy on his goofy scooter trying right. to get up this hill. Well, and I think that's the important thing about tone. All the word choice so far is really lighthearted, easygoing, comedic level of, of word choice. Um, so, e so far, each of these things is focused on sort of like the one thing that I want people to look at mm -hmm. for each particular time. So the next thing I want you to see 
is that his scooter is packed full of bulk groceries. Giant tubs of peanut butter, a gallon of mayonnaise, a case of ramen, a four bottle bundle of barbecue sauce, a bucket of Skittles, a few cases of LaCroix. And what I like about it is that it's really specific. So in a way, I, even though this is a lot of words on the page up front, but it's very specific to the visuals and there may be a camera panning over these items in the cart. And you know, it's up to the director to be able to choose that. For us as writers, we just wanna make sure all this is down. And in some ways, the, um, the stuff that's in the scooter does actually wind up being important later, but I'll, I'll tell you why once I kind of show a little more of my hand. Um, behind the scooter attached by a bungee cord is a shopping cart and bungee behind that is another shopping cart and behind that a third all overflowing with groceries. If it looks like Jonas just robbed a Costco, well, that's not very far from the truth. <laughs> right. So there's just a little bit of commentary there. It's totally fine, everybody watching, to be able to do something like that. Um, what happened here? Oh, what happened here is this. Okay, so I, I looked at what I had, and I was like, okay, I've started to set up the scene that I want people to see, and it's it's getting closer to the thing I have in my brain. But then I looked at this wall of text. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I don't know if I'm, if I'm reading through 40 scripts this week, maybe I don't want that wall of text. Uh, so I cheated and I decided to break up the wall of text with this right. sort of nothing bit of dialogue. Uh, and it's literally just to break up the page. So it's, he's listening to crazy train and he's on his scooter and he's singing crazy train. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the lyrics to Crazy Train happen to also state the theme of the story. Right. Uh, but I, like I said, I might cut Crazy Train. I might cut all, you know, I'm, I don't even know if this will wind up being the first scene. Right. Uh, but it works out in a lucky kind of way for me right now that it happens to be a lot of what um, some of this is going to wind up being about. So I kept it. And then um, at the bottom of the page, we've just gotten to seeing Jonas and his scooter, and I'm about to introduce the next idea, and I wanted to make sure that that rhythm jump was clear. So <laughs> I threw in another line of dialogue, which again, <laughs> I might cut, um, to make sure that the distinction between Jonas on his scooter and what comes next is clear. And that way, if you're skimming, um, you're going to hit that paragraph that's below this dialogue. Yeah with a little bit more of your eye. So if it looks like Jonas just robbed a Costco and then blah, blah, blah. Right, that's an trade. important point to make because a lot of readers do skim. They're just looking at words, they're not reading them aloud in their head. <laughs> Especially if the writer is throwing in garbage dialogue. That doesn't <laughs> <mean anything. laughs> um, so what I need you to see next is halfway up the street, the hill gets even steeper and the scooter is not going to make it. Yeah. I love that. Uh, so the scooter's stalling out. And I have this picture again of um, this, you know, this battery operated scooter where essentially it's working as hard as it can go to go nowhere. It's, it eventually just like levels out where the engine is revving and it's still going zero. Yeah, son um, of a bitch. <laughs> then I was like, okay, well, I'm introducing my main character for the first time. Is that really how I want to do it? Okay. No. <laughs> Even right, I love it. Um, let's make them a little bit more, a little bit nicer and a little more distinctive. Yeah. Um, at this point, Jonas gets off the scooter and still holding throttle, the scooter walks alongside it, pushing with all of his might, which is not much. <laughs> he grunts and groans and slowly inch by inch nudges his caravan to the top of the hill. Um, so this is the first big victory of the scene. Love he it. Stops to catch his breath and oh no, 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 no. At the crest of the hill, his whole crazy train teeters and begins rolling of its own volition down the other side. <laughs> now let's pause there a second. Um, and he, so there's so much fun on this page, just from son of a peach to, you know, is not going to make it. I love the, the lead in of the momentum. We also have a question from Patrick. What's your take on referencing specific songs and music? You know, and I'm assuming, Chris, you can speak to this too. It, you have to take with it the idea that it's probably not gonna be the song that's used. So you're, you wanna reference like what Chris is doing, 
a song that has something to say about the scene, about the overall theme of the project, throw the lyrics in there. It's fine. It, it, nobody's going to be like, hey, you can't do that. You know, the people reading this is going to, they're going to be reading it for the story. They're not going to be looking at the legal you know, ramifications of it. I wouldn't go all out and put entire lyrics of full songs throughout because then there's like a really specific reason for that song. Then it's going to be difficult to be able to get the rights to it. So anyway. I have Let's nothing keep going. to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> Everything Max just said. Um, so let's see, at the crest of the hill, oh, the crazy train begins rolling down the other side. Um, yeah. So at this point, Jonas dives for the scooter, but it gets away from him. And then I have some bits here. And again, I, I'll probably wind up streamlining the way this is written. Uh, he, he grabs the scooter, but it gets away from him. He reaches for the first cart and winds up holding a 36 pack of toilet paper. Finally, <laughs> he catches the rear cart, holding onto it for dear life to keep everything from careening downhill. That's when the bandits jump in. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Um, so yeah, I wanted, I wanted again to set up this sort of like mental picture of uh, just as he catches it with like his barely fingertips and he's got the balance precariously going. And again, there's a sort of breath of relief that he made it. Um, yeah. And then that's, that's when the scene actually begins. Right, right. Um, the bandits look like they're straight out of Mad Max. Spiky bracelets, spiky hair, and body armor made from sporting goods and car parts. The lead bandit, wearing a viciously painted hockey mask, lunges at Jonas with a tree pruner. And um, in typical bandit dialogue. <laughs> and it's interesting because I, I just have an <laughs> option here that if a character just screams or yells something, um, you don't necessarily need to put the line in dialogue. You can. I think part of the reason, and I'm totally guessing here, Chris, is to, that you did it this way is because it's kind of funny seeing it written out and it's supposed to be. <laughs> um, so it is a, it's a creative choice. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't my best dialogue. This <laughs> um, so at least certainly so far um, where it's, it's just Ozzy Osbourne and ARG. Um, and again, <laughs> I think part of it too is visually on the page. Um, I think if I'd had a lot of dialogue, then it, I might've just said the bandit growls at him or something right. like that. But because I have not had a lot of dialogue, um, I felt like it was actually a little better to break it up again. Yeah, to right, right. Um, and then Jonas responds as any of us would respond. Ah. <laughs> now the lead bandit muffled through his mask. Firm, firm. Um, this really is the best dialogue I've ever, I've ever written. I think. Um, Jonas looks confused. I can't understand you. The mask is muffling your. Firm, firm, firm. Maybe to enunciate. Um, and the lead bandit starts to lose his patience with Jonas here and says, Arg. The bandit swipes his tree pruner at Jonas's shopping cart, slicing open a jug of Sunny D. Then he lifts his mask a little over his mouth. I said, hands up. Um, so even I am getting a little tired by now of, of, the, uh, of the inventory of Costco goods. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that would be the last one for a while. <laughs> um, but at this point, I, I like I want you not to think of the bandit as much of a threat, right? Jonas doesn't think of him as much of a threat. And at the same time, it's a real weapon and it really sliced the jug. And so it's like you need to know he's capable of some actual damage. Yeah, right. Um, let's see, where are we here? Okay, so... Um, the bandit says, I said, hands up. And Jonah says, I mean, I can't really, if I let go. And this is what's fun is all this is happening pretty quick. It's yeah, bam, bam, yeah, yeah. bam. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and at that point, a second bandit jumps in. He's right. If he lets go, the whole thing will just roll. <laughs> exactly. It'll roll. Thank you. It'll roll down the, and then we'll just have to roll it back up. It just seems, and then the lead bandit concedes. Fine. Just, just stay there. We're going to rob you now. <laughs> Guys, you don't have to rob me. Just tell me what you need and I'll be happy to because this is the kind of guy Jonas is. Uh, right. He's a very non-confrontational, friendly, generous kind of guy. And um, even though these are bandits, he's happy to, he's, he's actually happy to provide them with what they need. But bandits being bandits, they'd actually rather rob him. So <laughs> um, Jonas looks more closely at the bandit. Skip. So he thinks he knows him. <clears throat> um, 
My name's not Skip. <laughs> Bennett says, my name's not Skip. I can see it's you. I'm slake eater, shepherd of mongrels, bleeder of souls. We are robbing you. You are being robbed. <laughs> um, Jonah says, I come here every single week and give you food, literally give it to you. Why would you? Um, <laughs> He's the late, the late bandit doubles down. <laughs> <laughs> doubles down um yeah some of this will get punched up later <laughs> punched yeah. up or cut. <laughs> i think it's fun <laughs> uh so the lead bandit with his raw and robbed arg but then he leans in toward jonas and he whispers it's me it's skip yeah <laughs> uh i'm starting this new gang i want to impress them can you just are you kidding me play along <laughs> You know, I deliver this food down to the people in ARG. Okay, so um, there's a little bit of back and forth happening here. Yeah. And uh, the bandit is trying to reason with him on the one hand, but it still still has to kind of play to the other bandits. Totally. So He's got a, pers a persona. Trying to play, yeah. trying to play tough. Um, and then Jonas has to double down too, right? No way, man. I pushed these cards all the way up. You know, this is the third steepest street in the United States. <laughs> um, but now the bandit pushes the tree trimmer against Jonas's chest in a way that might actually be menacing. I mean it, Jonas, hands in the air. And Jonas, under this new possible, actual, maybe threat. He concedes. Says, says, okay, fine. So he puts his hands up and sure enough, just as he knew it would, his caravan starts rolling down the hill. <laughs> There's a, a result to the action. So yeah, I told you that would happen. Um, yeah, the second band that's going to be running this operation pretty quickly. I yeah. <laughs> um, the lead bandit Skip dives to catch it, but it bowls him over and sends his hockey mask flying off his face. The shopping carts plummet down the hill. And the lead bandit says, don't just stand there, go get Let's it. pause there a sec, Chris. This is something yeah. I see come up sometimes. So now that we know his name is Skip, uh, yeah. sometimes writers do change it up and change it from lean ba lead bandit to Skip. It, it, it's kind of up to you. I mean, if Skip is going to be a long-term main character, it probably would make sense to flip to the name. Um, if not, then you just leave it as is because it's easy. Yeah. Um, and I, of course... I, you know, um, since I debated every single, <laughs> every single word that I put on the page, I certainly debated that. And what I decided was um, the next time Skip appears, he'll be Skip. But for the sake of this scene, he would stay lead. Right, bandit. right. Um, it actually reads much faster than obviously how we're presenting it here because we're going step by step. So it's just easier to see lead bandit. Plus, I imagined I was going to be typing it live and I wanted the auto <coughs> to, <laughs> to still work. Um, so now the bandits race down the hill after the loot. At the bottom of the hill, the caravan crashes. Skittles scatter. Red Bulls and uh, Bay antioxidant drinks explode. The bandits scramble and forage. Jonas yells down at them. Skip, I'm not coming back here. From now on, you want your coconut water. You want your protein shakes. You come and get it yourself. Jonas turns around to start walking back the way he came. But now we see... Um, the houses that line the street below him are abandoned and burned. The, parking ca the parked cars are charred and covered in dust. In the valley below, the city of Los Angeles is bombed out, smoldering, and destroyed. And then Jonas calls one more thing to the bandits before he leaves. Just because it's the nuclear apocalypse doesn't mean you have to rob people. You have a real austerity mindset. <laughs> that's, that's a great last line. And that is the scene. I love it. <laughs> Cheers, you know. If, if we were a live audience, we'd be getting applause. Um, I, what's so fun that everybody I'm sure is noticing is that for one thing, structurally speaking, it's important to note because of the fact that you're hiding the reveal of the world that they're in. And in our first sequence of a project, which is roughly the first maybe eight to 10 pages, you want to be establishing arena. So what's, what, what Chris is doing here is, is using that as a little bit of a, um, I was going to say ploy. It's not ploy, but it's a fun um, angle to be taking. So we're introducing character type and just overall situation with like what Rory is saying, a nice reveal of, oh, this is the world we're in. Why, why is he 
you know, maybe we thought Jonas was just homeless or something, but, or he's just really kind because he gives this to people who are maybe homeless too, but nope, we find out that there's this big reveal. So there you go. It was, uh, I think, part of the reason that I was so sort of keyed up at the very top of the scene with what I want people to see had as much to do with what I don't want them to see. Yeah, um, yeah, right. So I, I sort of needed to make sure people were looking exactly where I want them looking so that I didn't have to describe too much about the, the surrounding world. And because of you knowing the point of the scene overall. Right, right point of the scene or it's multiple things but it's also the point of the scene for the reveal of the world they were in while also relaying you know, character not necessarily development but presentation here's the person we're going to be experiencing this story through and with and what's important to note is that now we can tell no matter the situation Jonas is in we can probably assume how he's going to be reacting you know he's faced with pretty you know dangerous conflict so to speak here but Jonas is still actually just being himself so yeah it's great man just just for the sake of time we want to get to Yolanda and thank you Yolanda for being so patient but Chris this was great give us a little bit of a lead in in terms of what the project is here so this is a uh television project um I uh it's a new it's a it's a pilot that I am developing uh based off of my life um, you know, wanting to be an opera singer and a lot of the challenges that I faced as a kid growing up. Um, a lot of people don't know a lot about Mississippi and that's where I'm from. Great. And I think that this project will, you know, carry them on, you know, that journey of coming of age in the South, wanting to do something and be something different from what other people uh, usually want to do because in the African American community, you know, when you are a singer, they expect you to either do gospel, R&B, you know, whatever. So for me, it was always that challenge of balancing between the two, yeah. uh, being this opera singer, being this uh, R&B singer. So I had to train myself how to sing both. But oh, then wow. when I was faced with thyroid disease growing up it changed the structure of my voice. So it was Oof. a whole lot of challenges, plus all of the drama that my family has been through. So it's, it's, a, it's a very personal project uh, okay. for me. But I, I think just like how Lena Waithe did um, The Shy, um, I think that it's, it's a project that's worth, uh, <laughs> worth doing because people will you know, appreciate learning about the history of Vicksburg and things like that, you know? Yeah. Um, so okay. one thing about me guys is that I am a very traditional, uh, and structured, uh, kind of a screenwriter. Um, I got my MFA, uh, from Full Sail University and, uh, woo -woo to all the folks that's on the phone that ever went to, uh, uh, Full Sail, but, um, I, I kind of stick to a lot of the traditional style and I also, um, uh, and I'm sorry for all the noise in the background, but uh, okay, great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, just... I stick to a lot of the traditional style because what I found, um, even in um, even in uh, uh, screenwriting competitions, a lot of the feedback that I get is that people appreciate the visual uh, writing that I that I do and the the kind of structured. Uh, writing that I do. I sometimes break the rules because I think one of the things that's important to, uh, you know, navigate is finding your voice, knowing who you are as a writer, and you will find those things that work for you. It's, it's yeah. like uh, taking acting lessons because, you know, I mentioned at the top of the call that I am a um, uh, uh, actress also. And so for me, um, when I'm writing, I think from an actress brain, uh, okay. because I like to write from the voice of my characters. And I also like to write as an overall voice for myself as a writer, you Great. know, that, that makes it. sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you well, know, let me comment on just so everybody, as you, you I'll let you, I'll give you time to, to type this out, but, um, as you'll notice, she has the scene heading, um, underlined. And she's bolding Ave Maria. So we see that more often in TV than we do in features. Very rarely are you going to see in a feature a scene heading underlined. 
Um, totally fine to do that. Some people sometimes even bold and underline the scene heading in TV. Your best bet there is to try to find some TV scripts of shows that you like, that, that it, at the very least that you want to emulate um, you know, for your own uh, show, and then just use that same format. Whatever format they use, go ahead and use that. Um, this is a, a creative and stylistic choice, but I'll just make note that this is usually and, you know, quote unquote, only used in TV in terms of the underlining. And again, as long as you're consistent, um, then you're fine. You're, it, everybody will get it. Yes, and, and I agree because I don't do this. Uh, I don't underline uh, scenes when I am working on uh, when I am working on a feature film project. And you know the point to be made here with the Ave Maria is that for one, this is this is a drama primarily, mm -hmm. and so the 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 choice to um, write this out, and she's going to be writing the entire song. Well, not the entire song, but the right. primary portion of the song is coming <laughs> out because there's a feeling behind the tone of the song itself, but also it's because Anastasia is an amazing singer, so there's a level of of talent and ability that you're showing here and someone else is going to be watching her sing this right yeah. so it's that's why it, you can get away with the entire you know set of lyrics here and you're telling the audience we're going to be watching her sing all of these words this is not just for the fun of it you know she yolanda is specifically choosing to write this out um what's interesting is that Will this be formatted in the dialogue, though, Yolanda? Because right now it's just yes, it yeah, will. Yeah. Uh, I'll go back and um, you know just grab that and 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 uh, format it the way. Take out the the yeah. uh, the, the um, spacing and just kind of break that that verse up a little bit, you know, just so people will know that it is. And then when they're when they're singing, uh, when you know whatever, making an expression, of course, you know that you want to uh, italicize it so that it's distinct uh, within right. the song. And uh, so, um, so uh, in reference to this particular scene though, so, you know, Anastasia is a young uh, opera singer. To, uh, she is uh, being asked by her, um, her vocal coach, because when I was younger, my vocal coach uh, and my music teacher, he always uh, believed in me and he wanted to uh, put me in all these different competitions and stuff because he did think that I could be the world's next greatest opera. Wow. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. And so that's what this scene is about, you know, her going back to her uh, parents who don't have a lot of money, which I grew up in very humble beginnings, mm. uh, you know, asking them uh, to pay for the lessons. And she knows that her parents don't have the money. Okay. So, uh, and so um, what I like to do too, uh, guys, is that I like to fictionalize uh, my life. So I take real life circumstances and uh, I fictionalize them. Fictionalize and exaggerate. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, because that way it protects you as a writer when you want to write about a true story, but you know, you may not get the permission from everybody to do that, you know, but this is also true to my experiences of, of growing up. So, you know, at the same time, you know, you have to think about it from uh, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. All right, and so um, I had this really cool uh, friend, his name was Jonathan. And uh, <laughs> Jonathan was very, very uh, delightful. He was my best friend growing up. And I didn't change the name of that character because it, to me, um, it would take away from uh, who he was. Uh, but he he was just a very bold voice and we would laugh so much all the time <laughs> because he always had my back and um and was there for me through a lot of stuff so i um 
I, I I really love this Jonathan character, and what you will find is like he he is very opinionated, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so is so is Yolanda. You know the the Anastasia character. She's she's very opinionated a, a, as well. Um, <laughs> it's funny seeing everybody trying to type it out. It's, it's, yeah, it's a, a fun little experiment to see to <laughs> how often we make little goofs every now and then. Yes. And, um, you know, you guys were talking about using the dashes. I use yeah. dashes to cut off, to your point, what you were saying earlier, Max. I use dashes to cut off what people are saying sometimes to interrupt the conversation. But I also use dashes just to keep the, the script clean instead of using the ellipses too. Because I used to use ellipses all the time. And uh, last year I took a writing workshop and they were saying like it's much more industry standard today that if you, you know, are uh, thinking about using ellipses, you know, uh, try to use the dash because it makes the script cleaner. So, you know, that's part of the reason why I use dashes as well. Yeah, the dashes, it's just, it's like a train of thought kind of thing. And of course I have a leaf blower outside of my window. This is living in a city, but um, the dashes, we have to be considering how the, the reader is experiencing your screenplay. And you'll see with Yolanda's script here, it's a lot more left, you know, from left to right across the page writing, just because of the nature of the script itself, the nature of the story, it's a, it's a drama. It's, um, you know, slower, but I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just that's the feeling that the audience is going to have when they're watching this. It's a settle into the moment kind of uh, script and story, as opposed to Meg's and, and Chris's. That's a much faster, you know, it's a comedic approach. So, oh, it's good to know, Linda, that you can't hear the blower. <laughs> but um, so you'll see that, you know, she's using a lot more description. You're, she's forcing the reader to sit within the read of it on purpose. That's that's a purposeful choice. So that's something to be thinking about when you're you're working on your script. How do you think the reader is going to be experiencing the read? Because and it's an important question to be asking or at least be considering because if you want the scene to go quickly, meaning literally on screen, this is going to be a pretty fast screen, a lot of banter back and forth. It needs to read that way. If it's a slow scene that we're going to sit in, that we're going to be, you know, really experiencing Anastasia, her voice, the reactions of others, and it's kind of a slightly moving little moment in terms of hearing how beautiful her voice is, listening to the words of Ave Maria, and then we get into the process of the back and forth with Mr. Maddox and eventually Jonathan, you'll see how different the tempo is. And so the words on the page help control that tempo. And, you know, the, the best way to get that experience this is just by reading as many scripts as, as you possibly can, because, you know, I'll, I'll, Stephen King has said it many, many times that if you're not reading, then you're not, how can you say that you're a writer? It's a little harsh of a statement, but it's, it's kind of true. We have to be reading just as often as we're writing um, and writing as often as we're reading. So it's been, as, as many ways you can to get that, to get a script in front of you. Most of the time you can go online and Google the movie title with PDF. And you'll be able to find something, you know, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the perfect movie. It's just to read, you know, read as much as you can. <clears throat> so we've got Mr. Maddox asking about the fa uh, father. Why don't you ask him? This is about paying the bills and affording this. Um, I'm catching right. up. And, and um, she um, is, is really hesitant to want to ask, but he keeps driving the nail in on you know, what this could be, you know, for her, for her future. Um, and, you know, she really wants to go to Juilliard, uh, as you will be able to see here in, you know, in just a second, she wants to go and, and this is her overall life and what she wants to do. She wants to get out of that environment that she's being raised in uh, for a better life for herself. Um, right. Well, and I think a really important point to make here is that you'll notice with, um, in comparison to Chris's script, you know, that we knew that was the first scene of a feature. We know that this is a first scene of a series of a pilot. So she's two, one and a half pages in, and we're getting pretty much the setup of the situation right away. She wants to get, she wants, you know, Mr. Maddox wants her to go to, uh, 
to, and, and this is, I'll backtrack a little bit, you know, consider how much information is being presented and how quickly. We know that Anastasia has an amazing voice. She's a great singer. She's young. Um, Mr. Maddox believes in her, wants her to go to Juilliard. She wants to go to Juilliard. The big problem, she can't afford it. So a page and a half in, we already have all of this information. Mr. Maddox is trying to build her up. You really want to attend Juilliard, go back to your parents. So he's kind of giving her this level of go do this. And so there's, it's, it's fun to see that. It's not, I mean, the reason I'm comparing it to Chris is because Chris had the time to wait until page five because he's writing a feature. He can get a little bit of a setup there and he doesn't necessarily need to get the plot set up within those first five pages because again it's a feature and you can wait a little bit you want to spend more time on just getting to know who this character is a little bit um in tv you've got to do both and now we've got the person behind me also now sweeping the leads up into some form of a of a basket um so it's you know you've got a lot less time in a pilot and so you've got to be able to get everything from plot and character introduced as quickly as you can so here's Anastasia agreeing again great job today keep up the great work yes sir so we get a sense of how she responds to authority just by you know she respecting this guy yeah she has a ton of respect for him I was just about to say that <laughs> and that's why she responds uh in that way and then too you know in the south the way we were raised is that you say yes ma'am and no ma'am to your elders too so okay. you yeah. know your parents would slap the taste out of your mouth uh, if, if you did not respect your elders, kids today, <laughs> kids today will never know, you know, it's, it's, some people think that it has something to do, you know, with back in the day, but no, it really is a form of just respect, you know, yeah. people, so. People that came that, before you, yeah, I get that. Yeah. And uh, one thing about these characters is that they do have a, a ton of respect for one another. Yeah. All right. So then, you know, to the challenge of moving into a different uh, location. So, um, so with, uh, with this particular scene, so Jonathan has been sitting back the whole time. He's been watching, uh, uh, you know, the conversation because, you know, they all sing in the choir and that's the next move, you know, of where they are going to go in the scene. But um, he, he, he's that guy that knows how to get to Yolanda and, and really make her think, you know, because he always comes up with different options because uh, he's the risk taker. She isn't. <laughs> right, right. It's, yeah. So there is a, a new location, but there's a continuation of thought of, of intent of, of the point of the overall scene here because it's she's saying seconds later and so we're we're specifically still on as an audience we're still on what we just consumed in those first two pages and so Jonathan's going to continue that a little bit um yeah I was pointing out missing R <laughs> <laughs> so so also uh I put seconds later there because even though we continued this, uh, the scene, we moved into a different uh, area and that all can't fit in that slug line. Right. So I chose to put it in the, you know, description area of, of the uh, script itself. And that's, you know, that's totally okay to do totally. that. You can't fit everything in a slug line. As long uh, as it's consistent, as long as it's clear, most readers are not going to, you know, comment on that. They're like, okay, seconds later, fine. And then she's capitalizing students because these are just, you know, moving characters and they're, it's, she's emphasizing um, the visual of that. There are a whole bunch of students filing in. I find that this final draft here, this new one, uh, I'm on 12 too. <laughs> uh, it uh, loves to um, try to make decisions for you. Uh, uh, yeah, so that it, that's why it does what it does to this, this new version of a uh, final draft. Uh, I like to, I know that Meg uh, italicized her expression of the words, but I like to underline them sometimes. It's just okay. a traditional thing because it makes it a little bit more, you know, bolder sometimes with what the character is saying. And like she said too, it, it's, it's, it's better for the, the drama aspect versus, you know, the quicker aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. Every now and then it's fine to emphasize the way a character says a word. 
um, when it becomes a problem is when you're doing it in like every line. And then suddenly you're telling the actor how to deliver the line. And really it's, it's our writers, as writers, our responsibility to set up the overall scene and the feeling of the scene, who these characters are, so that the actor and the director can take that from us. You know, we're, our job is somewhat finished once you get the rest of the cast on, on board uh, and, you know, talent and crew and everything. Um, so it's, it's a setup for everybody to come in and join. So we don't want to overstate. We don't want to be going over the top. Like every now and then, like Yolanda's going with back. Fine. You know, it tells me as the reader to emphasize the read of that, you know, about going back to your parents. That's how I would be saying in my head, you know. Just to comment as you keep going, Yolanda. So Simon is saying, when I first arrived in Hollywood, I was told you can't read a script until you've read a thousand scripts. You know, it's... Uh, <clears throat> It's probably a little bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> but I get the point. Um, it's, you've got to be reading a ton of scripts, read as much as you possibly can. It's totally free. It's the best, really the best source of education you can get. Um, everybody at the ISA, we're reading scripts constantly and we're always improving and we're always becoming, you know, just that much more educated. Um, and, you know, on a little bit of a side note there, I heard a producer tell a new writer who had just come into town, um, like literally had just moved into town and he said that you're not a writer until you've written 10 screenplays and i thought you know that's kind of a shitty thing to tell a new writer when they've just moved into town um but i understand what he was saying is that your your first script is rarely if ever going to be the one that get that puts you on the map it might get you noticed if you really knock out of the park park but the likelihood of selling it is is low i mean that's just the way the industry is that's not me being negative so you have to then move on to your next one you just have to you got to keep writing churn them out you know when i'm working with my writers one-on-one -on -one through my consulting company um when we're done with a script i tell them if you can afford it try to find other people to you know pay somebody to read this and give you additional notes let's start on something else or you know submit it to a contest in the meantime we'll start on something else so you got to be moving forward um Julian Fellows says you're not a writer till you've you've been fired. <laughs> I could kind of see that. That might be a little bit of a joke. Um, all right. So Jonathan says, I'm sorry, but you know what I mean. Look, you need to think about that offer from your cousin. Anastasia says, I'm not trying to hustle candy. Nope, not doing it. You can make real money in the school, though. Think about it. He's already bought a car selling and I'm in MMs and taste the rainbows. The, the, that money could help you pay for your lessons. So what like Yolanda was saying, Jonathan knows how to talk a good game. You know, he's digging in and understands where Anastasia's current wound is, that she doesn't have any money and she really needs it. And so he's kind of convincing her in a way, you could do this and it's gonna solve the current problem. And, um, and that current problem she has is a very noble one. So he's kind of combining some of the emotional issues going on here. So he's, you know, he's like the devil on her shoulder. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and... Uh... But as you can see, he he's already convinced her to, you know, do a side hustle instead of asking her parents for, for anything. So because here's a good question. You know, like, like Rory is asking candy as in candy or is he just can use this is like a, he's talking about something else. No, literally candy. Okay. Uh, yeah. When I was when I was in school, uh, when I was in school, my uh, uncle who was born uh a couple years older than me my grandmother had him late so i had an uncle that went to high school with me but uh he he sold and hustled candy and he bought cars with skittles m and m no way straight up like it was a straight up business <laughs> and, um, and i'm talking about like he bought new clothes it was it was his hustle so instead of, instead of selling drugs he sold candy in school and and I don't know if anybody here on the phone ever went to school with people who uh, sold can uh, sold candy in high school, but it was a it was a real thing when I was coming up in the. Oh, 80s. funny! Elliot is saying, "Yep." <laughs> <laughs> like, cause and, and it was always a high too, like eating candy in, in class and then um, eating candy in class and then getting uh, keeping it from your 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 teachers and stuff. It was always a thing, you know? 
Yeah. Uh, and so for for us uh, watching him, he bought two cars off of selling candy and uh, had a whole team of people. He had a whole empire oh uh, of folks and they would pay him a percentage of what they sold uh, in school. So that's why Jonathan presents her with this this offer like, hey, so, you know, sell some some candy and, and get your hustle on. You know, you got your cousin that's selling this candy but in real life it was my uh uncle <laughs> who was just a year older than me and we were going to the same school and he had so much respect and when i tell you guys it may have been a drug uh uh thing you know because he could have done that because um <laughs> uh, uh he ran them like that like right. how drug lord would be like hey run me my money oh how money. funny he oh would no. people up if they didn't you know run him his money at the end of the week <laughs> so, so a couple of things to comment on with the words here that i'm seeing so for one the use of exclamation points so is this a, a conscious decision for you yolanda that i really do want these exclamation points here yeah because that's that's i'm just being expressive of of who uh jonathan and and um at the end of that particular scene of who they are uh you know for the expression more so than anything now yeah. the actor may make a different choice because even me as an actor just because i see them go get suspended for selling skittles no sometimes it's more of i'm gonna beat your ass uh if i get suspended for selling skittles yeah 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 you okay. know it's more of an expression than it is a, a scream or a yell yeah and, and i think the actor is intelligent enough to understand that part that it's not always the the yell of it. It's the uh, uh, it's the expression of the yeah. of the. Of the, and the writer needs to be aware of that too, because it is easy to overuse uh, exclamation points. I've mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of scripts just kind of go over the top, and I'm like, after a while, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to be taking the exclamation point in. So you really like Yolanda is doing. You have to be aware of why and when you're using that exclamation point because it really does make a difference. Exactly. Hold on a second. And that is the end of the scene. So there it is. So basically what you had was the setup of an issue and a problem for Anastasia. And she followed the, obviously the parameters that we set up here that a character is can, trying to convince one character of something. And what's fun is that the questions came up in the comments. Like, I wonder if the TV audience would also be wondering is this actually candy or do they mean is it drugs and i because I, I and maybe that's a good thing you're making them question oh god this is going to be you know what i mean um yeah. yeah and you know what it you know uh i think that sometimes um i think that sometimes what where we as the audience is more the writer wants the audience to discover it rather than you know just no right up front so i think that it would be cool if the the audience discovers that it's not candy you know you know like candy in the sense of drugs it's yeah. like literal candy and they go oh they were really talking about right. candy. you know and i think it's just it's a choice uh of the writer personally i haven't decided yet whether or not i will let them discover it or if i will blatantly you know, say that because this is more of like a, a a freestyle, you know, of where I'm going, you know, in the teaser in the setup okay. of it all. So, yeah. you know, that's 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 to be determined. But I do think that that's something to consider. I appreciate you know that feedback. But yeah. I think personally, it would be cool for them to discover that it's actual candy rather. Oh, than I totally think it would be. Yeah, okay. I want them to because it, it's a, you're playing with the audience. And because that's what I was thinking when I was reading it. I'm like, Oh, no, Jonathan's a horrible guy. But then suddenly we're gonna find out <laughs> no, his kids just really actually saw candy. But I think what's important here from a, a page perspective is that you're noting it's a teaser. So that when the reader walk, you know, walks in, opens the script and starts reading and they're like, all right, this is gonna be probably moving a little faster than the normal pages, but maybe not, you know, you're setting the tone. And so the reader's thinking all of these things, right? That it's an unconscious thought process. Four pages, three and a half pages that you currently have is a, is a really nice number for a teaser. And so we can all learn from this level of, 
like what you were saying, Yolanda, a very traditional approach to the scene direction. It, you know, there's nothing crazy that she's doing. There's nothing really fancy. It works, but you're also taking your time with it because you're setting the level of tone that's then going to be expected throughout the rest of the script. Like if, if Yolanda were to suddenly on page six, have this action sequence where it's like Shane Black writing lethal weapon down the page, we would be like, did I open up a different screenplay? You know, so you have to be consistent with the process of the words on the page, for sure. I learned a lot from just Chris and Meg. Uh, you know, Chris, I have Scribner too, but I use that for uh, novel writing. So mm. I thought it was interesting to watch you use it because you can use it for screenplays and stuff like that. So I thought it was interesting to watch how you organized all your scenes and you knew where to go from scene to scene. So I thought that that was really cool. And even in the way that you kind of captured some of the description moments in your feature film um, where, you know, you were suggesting, you know, rather than it may be something you use later or, or not use later, you know, I thought that that was really cool. Uh, and it's just, it's, it's, like I said earlier, it's amazing to watch how, you know, we all process and do our scripts in different ways. Uh, and Meg, when she was using, um, the, the back and forth and, and uh, breaking the rules. She broke a lot of rules as, as, as a writer. And I thought that that was really cool because they were intentional breaking. And uh, every moment mattered from that banter going back and forth. And I felt the rhythm as she was writing, you know, going back and forth in between them, you know, debating about this one word, but also how petty you know, arguments can be in relationships. And it's just like, oh my gosh, because like my grandmother and my granddad <laughs> used to argue about tomatoes and who caught the biggest fish. So <laughs> that was just like <laughs> people. Yeah. And, and to me, how long have they been together? Because I felt like they had been together a while. Yeah. That's why they could go back and forth like that. Because I feel like the longer you stay with someone, the more petty the arguments can become sometimes. Depending sure. on the person now. Sure. Thank you. I wanted the argument to be banal. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I'll, I, I'll let them speak too. I thought this was, yeah, I thought this was a ton of fun. Thank you, Chris, for being so organized. With I'm so jealous of Chris's <laughs> organization. I'm organization. telling you, I was just scared I would get all tongue tied if I had to type. Well, I, it, it, it helped a lot. It was, it was smart. Awesome. It was smart. Yeah. yeah. Do you intend to use your writing as a way to also showcase your acting? Do you also pitch with any other things in mind? Yes, I do. And that's, that's great that she asked that question because I was just telling one of my producers on one of my projects yesterday, I don't write to unattach myself. I write so that I can be a part of those projects too, but I also don't have to be a part of every project. Uh, some of the projects that I write, I write because I want to see other people act them out because I don't want to live inside that particular story. So, you know, it, it, it's twofold. Some I want to be a part of, some I just want to write and produce um, uh, because I think that it's important too that actors have an opportunity to be a part of stuff where they can have rich characters and, yeah. you know, because we don't get a lot of that. Uh, believe it or not, we don't get a lot of opportunity <laughs> to showcase the richness uh, in writing. Uh, so I try to write stuff that I, I see myself being a part of, but I feel other actors want to be a part of too. That's great. So that's a great question. Yeah. Well, Chris and Meg, Yolanda, this was awesome. Um, thank you uh, really a lot for doing this. This is a, this is an experiment that I think went well. But Good. thank you all for, you know, uh, selecting us to do this. And okay. it was so fun. And I feel like it stretched me uh, as a writer to even, I was forcing myself to, you know, even just look at my script and think outside the box as you were commenting, Max. So I think it was would be great to have different writers do this because mm -hmm. it does help you to see what am I doing anything wrong but also grab some pointers from from other writers so right. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah yep. I, I think I think uh, it's awesome thank you well y'all y'all knocked it out of the park so yeah we'll definitely be doing this again sometime in the near future so you know whether you're able to to participate as you are now or at least just jump in and, and watch for a little bit it's um we're going to be doing it again man so hey